Some heroes are destined to be fan favorites, immortalized by the impression they leave on the players. Others, well, others are better off long gone, and no amount of stuns, tornadoes, or mechanics based on gold are going to change that. You know what you're here for. Here's another batch of Dota's Forgotten Heroes. Wandering in first is the Astral Trekker, a melee strength hero on the Sentinel side who uses a Spirit Walker model. His gameplay revolves around stunning his targets and wailing down on them while they're vulnerable and helpless. He first made an appearance in Dota TFT, a mod of the original Dota before All Stars came around. Here, his original name is Nostradamus, and his skills are completely different from his All Stars form. He had Sloth, which slowed an enemy down, Doppelganger, which created up to three illusions, Anti-Magic Field, which is like a reverse ghost form, increasing magic resistance, decreasing physical resistance, and slowing Nostradamus' movement speed, and his ultimate, which was essentially Chain Lightning. His skills were kind of all over the place, and this lack of cohesion made for a forgettable hero. Once ported over to Dota All-Stars, Astral Trekker's name was changed to Wanderer, and a reboot of his abilities allowed his identity to take shape as a disabling bruiser. His first skill was Entrapment, a simple point-and-click snare that would bind a unit for up to 10 seconds. With half a brain, the inclusion of one other teammate could eliminate a target by simply beating them to death with auto-attacks. But as you'll see with his other skills, you can take matters into your own hands. His next skill is War Stomp. This deals a small amount of damage and stuns in a small radius around the Wanderer, with the stun lasting for 6 seconds at max level, and it's only on a 7 second cooldown. While Ensnare is useful for taking out one opponent at a time, War Stomp was a powerful tool for locking down a team. For reference, Reverse Polarity stuns for up to 4.75 seconds every 2 minutes, and of course these numbers sound nutty by today's standards, but even back then, this was a pretty significant lockdown. The Trekker's next skill is Giant Growth, which is essentially the Avatar spell. This provided a temporary buff that gives extra HP, damage, armor, and spell immunity for its duration. The buff lasted for 50 seconds, and it was on a 60 second cooldown, meaning there's only a 10 second cooldown when Wanderer could be hit with spells. So far, this hero is hyper tanky and can pretty much beeline toward his target and take them out. What more could you possibly want? Astral Trekker's original ultimate was Summon Earth God. This brought out a tanky golem that would mini-stun on cast, and comes with Hurl Boulder, a 2 second point and click stun, hardened skin, a passive which reduces incoming damage, and a passive spell immunity. It wasn't as though Trekker couldn't delete heroes off the map if he wanted to, but this spell only made his job that much easier. You wouldn't even need a teammate around since you could summon your own. All in all, this first form of Astral Trekker was Roaming Death, as his stuns and damage could pick off anyone unfortunate enough to be on the receiving end of his fury. He has had a couple of changes in his brief time in Dota, the first of which happened around 0.95, where Summon Earth God was changed to Summon the Hulk, which made the golem green and was probably just done for a little bit of fun. It also replaced Hardened Skin with Ground Smash, an AoE slow that only added to the murder train. In 2.60, Giant Growth became his new ultimate, with the number value staying the same, while Summon the Hulk was replaced with Pulverize. This added a small amount of splash damage to each of Astral Trekker's auto attacks, and by small, I mean 21 at max level. One Claymore's worth of damage for 3 skill points is absolutely garbage, but it did make Astral Trekker more well-rounded, since he didn't end up having godly abilities in all slots. Wanderer's final sighting was in patch 3.2, where Entrapment was nerfed slightly, only binding an enemy for up to 7 seconds at max level. And even so, it was still pretty strong. He was officially put to rest in patch 4.0, presumably because there's no reasonable way to balance something like him at the time. I'd like to think that he's roaming out on a farm somewhere, stunlocking the ever-loving hell out of the rest of the livestock. Blowing in next is Teori Kikaze, the God of Wind, a ranged intelligence hero from the Sentinel who uses the Wildkin model. For the preservation of my sanity, I will be referring to him as Kaze, which, side note, means wind in Japanese. The first part of his name, though, is just a jumbled mess to make him sound more mythical or something. Being introduced in 6.00, this angry bird received a small chunk of lore, explaining that he's a friend of Zeus who was sympathetic to the Sentinel cause. Kaze was outcast by the other gods for his unique quirk of wanting to murder all of them. It doesn't seem like there was much of a plan to keep Kaze on full time, as the loading screen mentions that he was intended to be a filler hero, and this shows in his skill set. He plays like something of a disruptive spellcaster, although he wasn't quite at the level of Ginsu's craziness that we've come to expect. 
His first skill is Tornado Blast, a point-and-click nuke that dealt damage, a small stun, and it moved its targets backwards ever so slightly. Best used as an early game harass, the scaling of the spell only affects the damage, and even then, it's not all that impressive. In theory, this spell could be used for engaging or disengaging, but the numbers just aren't there. A fully fleshed out hero with a few more patches could see some good tweaks to the spell to make it more viable, but this just isn't the case for the God of Wind. Next up is Tornado Barrier. This spell shields Kaze for up to 300 damage, which isn't too shabby, but it doesn't feel like it matches up with his design. He doesn't seem like a tanky fighter, so the ability seems to exist for the sake of newer players. If he were able to cast the spell on his allies, or if the shield granted extra movement speed to tie it closer to his overall theme, it wouldn't be too bad. But wouldn't you know it, Tornado Barrier is on an incredibly long cooldown, and it engulfs you in a very distracting effect that announces to the world, Hey, I have a shield on, please don't spank me. Overall, very lackluster. Kaze's third skill is Displace, and it's a pretty weird ability. This makes Kaze fade for a moment, reappearing at a random spot in an AoE, depending on the level. Wherever he reappears, he'll deal 100 damage, and it's a pretty spammable ability, being only on a 3 second cooldown. Leveling up the spell only lowers its random AoE range, which quite frankly isn't worth the effort. Keep it at level 1, and let fate roll the dice. The God of Wind's ultimate is Typhoon. This whips up a huge cyclone that shoots in a straight line, damaging and knocking up enemies for pretty decent numbers. It's a good initiation or counter initiation, and if it looks familiar, well this would later be adopted by Invoker, though it would be renamed Cyclone. When considering the character as a whole, I think there's a lot of potential. His initial numbers were pretty garbage, but with a few adjustments, I can see him being able to hang among the rest of the cast. However, he truly was a filler hero, as his last appearance was in 6.02, a mere three weeks since his introduction. He wouldn't be completely erased from existence though. In 6.50, several changes were made to neutral creeps in general, with the Wildkin camp being introduced here. The enraged Wilkin comes with Tornado, and although it's not quite what Kaze had in store, this creep serves as an homage to God of Wind's brief stint in the game. Erupting onto the stage now is Flamelord, a ranged intelligence hero who uses Gul'dan's model. Unlike the other heroes of the Ginsu era, Flamelord's name is rarely ever mentioned alongside the busted mechanics and infinite stun durations that define the game in that time. This is because he's unusually simple and boring, leading him to be one of the relatively weakest heroes in the game. Like Astral Trekker, Flamelord was first in Dota TFT, although he's an agility hero that uses the Shaman model. All of his spells here are completely different than his All-Stars counterpart, but the theming remains the same. Very quickly though, he's got Engulf, which is a single target nuke that splashes, much like Frost Nova. Summon Fire Elemental conjures up a fairly beefy ranged unit. Molten Barrier adds some armor onto a friendly unit for up to 3 minutes, and Meteo summons a few meteors that deal fairly heavy damage. This spell would be repurposed in All-Stars, so don't dump it out of your memory banks just yet. After being imported into Dota All-Stars, Flamelord would take the title of Shaolin Monk, and here, his very boring legacy would start. First is Flameshot, a simple nuke that deals okay damage, and stuns for up to 7 seconds at max level, which actually isn't too bad. It only suffers from being very dull as far as mechanics go, and the only advantage this has over a similar spell like Magic Missile is that it's a fireball. And as a kid growing up in the 90s, fireballs are way cooler than first level Dungeons & Dragons spells. Following this is Firestorm, a channeling spell that calls down up to 10 waves of fire that deal damage to enemy units and buildings. There is an obvious synergy here with Flameshot, but it also has application as a siege tool, since its range keeps Flamelord out of harm's way. Although you may be vulnerable over the duration, you just have to put faith in your teammates that they won't let you die. Ahem. <clears throat> well, anyway. Next is Liquid Fire, a passive ability that causes Flamelord's auto attacks to apply a debuff for 5 seconds that deals damage over time and very slightly slows the enemy down. As a huge fan of DOT passives, I know a flaming pile of garbage when I see one. 4 damage per second just isn't enough to justify ever leveling it up on purpose, and each level only adds an extra 2 damage per second, which is pretty insulting. It feels like a wasted slot, and this is extra baffling because there were 4 whole spells that you could have taken from the original Flame Lord to swap in. Even with increased numbers, this spell wouldn't even fit in with the rest of his kit, making it stick out like a sore thumb that needs to be amputated. Flame Lord's first ultimate was Meteor. This calls down a single meteor from the sky, dealing a huge amount of damage on impact, which can also affect buildings. 
This spell feels strong and grandiose, as an ultimate should be. That's kind of all it does, but when it has the potential to wipe out a few enemies, it doesn't really need to do much more. In 4.0, Flame Lord's ultimate was replaced by Flame Circle. This summons a ring of fire around the hero, which deals 100 damage per second for any opponent standing in it. The terrain would last for a long duration, so overall, this change was an upgrade and an interesting one to boot. In 5.1, his title was changed to Fanadin. Now, this seems like an oversight, as Fanadin was likely meant to be Flame Lord's name, but they couldn't even bother to switch it around. So canonically, this man's parents named him Flame Lord, and he went to Orc College to major in Fanadin, with a minor in finance. In 5.5, Flame Circle was renamed to Inferno, but who really cares, because in 5.52, his ultimate changed back to Meteor. His numbers were tweaked over this period of time, and here's what he ended up with. Flameshot only stunned for 1.5 seconds, Meteor's damage was terrible for an ultimate, Firestorm was lackluster overall, and Liquid Fire dealt a whopping 8 damage per second at max level for 6 seconds. Looking at it now, it's reasonable to say that Flame Lord was dropped because they just didn't find any motivation to change him. It's not like it would be that hard to change his numbers to make him a little more viable, but it just never happened. In 5.54, the Flame Lord was snuffed out, and Centaur Warchief took his place in the Sentinel Taverns. Thanadin never received the adulation that former heroes got when looking back on the game, but it's almost like he never stood a chance. With a forgettable kit and personality, Flame Lord's honor almost faded away. But through the power of Dotaology, let us remember his contributions and have his legacy burn on. Finally, here's what you've all been waiting for, Maverick the Gambler. I was pretty conflicted by including him in this, because everyone's made it really clear that he hasn't been forgotten. Before I get into all of this, Proves Reviews has done a really great job of covering Maverick already, so a lot of the information is going to overlap. But she does go into greater detail about the bugs, and has footage from 6.00 which I couldn't get, so I recommend you give the video a looky-loo. Without further ado, the Gambler is another ranged intelligence hero on the Sentinel side who uses Medivh's character model. The lore states that Maverick was a down-on-his-luck peasant for most of his life, until poker became popular in Stormwind. He was able to make a great deal of money through his impeccable luck, but after losing it all to the Sentinel heroes, he threw his lot in with them to earn his money back. As his name suggests, Maverick's gameplay is focused around gambling, with abilities that utilize the player's gold count. His first skill is called Anti-Up. This is a single target ability that either heals an allied hero or damages an enemy hero at the cost of mana and 100 gold. Regardless of their allegiance, the spell will place a buff on your target. If that hero gets a kill, you'll be rewarded with up to 600 gold at max level. But if that hero dies, you cash out only half as much. If the buff times out after 60 seconds, well, you just lost your initial bet of 100 gold. As you can see, Anti-Up takes the concept of betting and embodies it into a fun mechanic where you can put your money where your mouth is. Next is Roulette. This deals damage to a hero based on a multiplier of their level. In 6.00, this could be used to slaughter your allies if you were so inclined, as it required at least two heroes nearby to activate, whether they were friend or foe. In 6.01, this only affected enemies, and the damage was increased to the enemy hero's level, plus 4. The maximum possible damage the skill could inflict is 35 times the quantity of 25 plus 4, which comes out to 1015 damage. Following this is a passive ability called Lucky Stars. This gives Maverick's auto attacks a small chance to proc an additional effect. If attacking a creep, he can instantly kill it. If attacking a hero or building, he can deal an extra 250 damage. What's interesting about this in retrospect is that Drow Ranger's current ultimate, Marksmanship, is like a modern version of the spell with obviously better numbers and more synergy with its hero. Additionally, Lucky Stars has a chance to grant the gambler a small amount of gold per auto attack. In my testing, it was about a 20-25% to chance to proc, granting 4-8 to eight gold at level 1. As Prove goes over in her video, the passive procs at the beginning of the attack, not when it lands. This means you can repeatedly cancel your auto attacks, triggering the ability much more frequently than intended. The Gambler's ultimate is All In. This deals damage to a target enemy, ranging anywhere between 1 and your current gold count. In 6.00, this had no limit, so if you were holding on to 5,000 gold by level 6, then yeah, you could nuke someone for 5,000 damage. In 6.01, this was changed to have a hard cap, but you still had a fairly decent shot at deleting a squishy hero. There is a chance, however, that this spell could fail, resulting in zero damage and you losing all of your gold. It's a real double-edged sword. On one hand, you don't want RNG to render you useless, but it's also really hype if you can pull off the max damage. 
This spell brings everything together. The rest of Gambler's kit was already a menace to society, but the potential to deal an extra 2500 damage on top of everything was just insult to injury. And, and, and also a little bit more injury, I guess. In 6.04, Roulette was replaced with Chipstack. This deals damage to an enemy hero based on a percentage of their current gold count, dealing 30% at max level. Using Maverick's own gold pool is one thing, but you'd have to be really on top of your finances to avoid being punished by this spell. Overall, I feel like this was a great addition, as Roulette was a little too gimmicky for my tastes. This spell fit in better thematically and has better cohesion with his other spells. For maximum efficiency, you can have an ally feed themselves to your target, allowing this spell to deal more burst. 6.04 also saw Lucky Stars receive a considerable buff, as each level increased its chance to proc by 4%, making his stuttering farm tactic much faster. All In also received a more defined failure rate here, at 20, 15, and 10% respectively. Despite it being scary to lose all of your gold, the percentage rates here are definitely in your favor, or at least that's what Fire Emblem Math has taught me. In 6.06, .06, Anti-Up came with an addendum at the bottom of its skill description, stating that it will not work on allied Pudge or Techies dying. The exploit was likely fixed at this point, but it's really funny to see that they needed to point this out in the description. All In also increased its chances to fail to the point where it's a little bit too risky for my liking. In 6.07, Maverick the Gambler was put to rest, and he was seemingly replaced by Spirit Breaker, who was introduced in this patch. The patch notes mentioned that he had a possible rework in mind, but that never came to fruition, clocking in Maverick's lifespan at only 3 months. His memory lives on in the bitter stories of players who had to deal with his nonsense, but is there a chance he might come back? I wouldn't bet on it. And there you have it, another handful of heroes who couldn't weather the storm. As always, it's fun to look back on these characters, and to wonder what would have happened if they had just a little bit more development time. Would they hold up in this day and age? What would you alter to make them fit in? Let me know. While you're here, please follow me on Twitter, support the channel through Patreon, and click on all the doodads. I'm Dennis the Tall, and those were more forgotten heroes of Dota.